All right, John chapter 1, start there. Uh, we finished up <coughs> last week on the book of Jonah, and this morning I'm going to start on the book of John, and, um, but I'm actually going to start it uh, this morning in Sunday school, uh, not the text per se, but I want to um, uh, talk about the Word of God uh, capital W versus lowercase w, Word of God versus uh, the written word. And, um, and there's, um, there's the things that are said of both. Okay, Jesus Christ is the Word, capital W. And the, the Word of God, the written word, is, a, is always a lowercase w in Scripture. And um, there are things in the Bible that are said of both. The, the written word... And Jesus Christ, the capital word, and, and there's many things that are said about both. And this morning I want to start a short series. I'm not sure how many weeks it'll take, um, but however long it takes, it takes. And look at these things um, that the Bible says are, truth of, are true of both. Now look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning was the word. That's a capital W there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's um, uh, John presents Jesus Christ as, as deity, as the Son of God, as God manifest in the flesh. And there you have Jesus Christ, uh, one of his names, uh, actually the name, even before the name he had of, as, as Jesus, he has always been the Word. Uh, look at 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. First John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. There's that capital W. Every time you see the, the capital W, it's always a reference to Jesus Christ. And um, some writers um, uh, in their commentaries, in, in an attempt to be respectful to the written word of God, they will capitalize word of God, but they're, uh, they're destroying the truth of what the Bible presents when they do that because capital W word of God is always a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, look, at, uh, look at chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That's the word of life. That's Jesus Christ. One more on this. I'll give you one more. Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse number 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Capital W, the Word of God. So the Word is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just a couple references on the written Word. Of course, there's many, many, many that you could give, but... Uh, if get two places, Ephesians chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 4. Hopefully these are familiar verses to you. Never take them for granted, always read them. Uh, every time you come across these, uh, these verses... Read them like you would read any other verse. Ask the Lord for help. Some of the verses that we know so well, we've heard so often, we've heard our whole life, sometimes we read, we read over them and we don't even ask the Lord for understanding because in our mind, yeah, I already know what that verse says. There's a lot more, 
the Lord's understanding is infinite. So even when you're reading verses that you maybe you have memorized for years, maybe you could quote, there's still always something new the Lord can show you. Ephesians 6, verse number 17. Ephesians 6, 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God, that's lowercase, it's the written Word. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So there's the, the written Word. So... This morning, like I said, I'm going to start out a, a, a short series on things that are true, things the Bible says of both the written word and the word Jesus Christ. Uh, first of all, number one, they are both truth. They are both truth. Look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Verse number 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus Christ, the Word, the Word of God, he is the truth. Uh, in, in Titus chapter 1, verse number 2, it says, um, God cannot lie. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says uh, it's impossible for God to lie. So Jesus Christ himself is the truth. Now look at John 17. John 17, verse number 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So the word of God, the written word, is also truth. Everything you hear in this life, everything you hear someone say, every idea, every philosophy, everything you hear ought to be filtered through the truth of the Word of God. And uh, anything that doesn't match the truth of the Word of God, you just throw it out as false. This book is truth. Jesus is the truth. The Word of God is the truth. Uh, number two, along the same uh, it's, it's very similar, but there, there's a little bit of a, of a subtle difference. Number two, without error. Without error. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 1 John chapter 3. 1 Peter 2, verse number 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Look at 1 John chapter 3, verse number 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So in Jesus Christ, there's no error, there's no fault, there's no sin, nothing whatsoever wrong with Jesus Christ. Uh, now, get Psalm 33 and Psalm 119. Psalm 33 and Psalm 119. Psalm 33, look at verse number 4. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. The word of the Lord is right. You can count on it every time. Look at Psalm 119, verse number 140. 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. So pure is, means there's no mixture of anything else. If something is pure, it contains 100% uh, that ingredient. It's not mixed with anything else. So the Word of God is not just pure, it's very pure. It's right, and there's no percentage of where, where we have to say there's some error mixed into it. It's very pure. It's not only right, it's nothing but right. It's pure. 
Okay, number three. Number three. Perfect. Perfect. Both the Word of God, written Word of God, and both Jesus Christ are both said to be perfect. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, perfect does not mean sinless, okay? Perfect means complete. Jesus Christ was always sinless. <laughs> there was never a time when he wasn't sinless. But the Bible says in verse number 10 that the captain of our salvation was made perfect. Make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So before, now this is what the Bible says. Before Jesus Christ suffered, he wasn't perfect. He was always holy. He was always sinless. He's, he was always righteous, but he wasn't perfect. That's what the Bible says. He was made perfect through sufferings. In other words, he wasn't, there was some part of his being left to be completed, left to be perfected. That's what the Bible says. Look at Hebrews chapter 5. I'll explain this in a minute. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number, nine, uh, verse number 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So again, Jesus Christ was made perfect through his sufferings. Now, you say, well, how, what is, how was he not perfect before he suffered? Well, back in the Old Testament, the Lord never was tempted with sin, right? James chapter 1, verse 13, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. God couldn't be tempted with sin. He was above that. But Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says, Jesus was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So God, in the Old Testament, he could say, thou shalt keep this commandment, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. But he had never suffered being tempted. He didn't know what it was like to have to resist temptation. He didn't know what it was like to have to turn away from temptation. But after he came to this earth, then he knew how to do it, and he did it successfully every single time. At all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he was complete in a way he wasn't before he came down here. Uh, Psalm, uh, I'll give you the reference, we won't turn there. Psalm 121, verses 3 and 4, says, The Lord will not sleep, neither will he slumber. And another place he said, If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> and yet when he came to this earth, he, he fell asleep, and he was hungry, and he was tired, and he was weary. So Jesus Christ became uh, perfect after he suffered, not only those things, but eventually the sufferings of the cross. Now, that, that's important as we get to the Word of God being perfect. Look at uh, James chapter 1 and Psalm uh, 19. James chapter 1 and Psalm 19. We'll look at the James passage first. James chapter 1, look at verse 26. Excuse me, verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the perfect law of liberty. Look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19, look at verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now, here's where it's important to understand the definition of perfect. As we saw in Hebrews, 
Perfect doesn't mean sinless because Jesus was always sinless, but he was made perfect. So perfect means complete. Now that's important when we talk about the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is perfect. Now we've already seen that it's truth. We've already seen it's without error. This isn't just a, the fact that when the Lord says his word is perfect, that's not a restating of truth. That's not a restating of the fact that it's without error. That gives you additional details, extra helpful details about the word of God. It is perfect. It is complete. In other words, it's not just true in what it talks about. It talks about everything you need. If, if, in other words, like, in other words, say, I'll say it like this. If the word of God was truth and it was without error, but it wasn't perfect, you could still say, well, everything it says is right. Everything it says I can count on, but there's some things that I can need, that I need for my life that is not in there, right? If it's not perfect, if it's not complete, although it may be true, although it may be right, it doesn't have everything I need. So the Bible says the word of God is perfect. Not only is it true, not only is it right, it has everything you need for this life and the life to come. And, and, uh, and, and that's important because people say, people say, well, if I want to know the difference between the rapture and the second coming, then I'll consult the Bible. If I want to know what I believe about a certain doctrine, I'll consult the Bible. But if I want to know who I should be friends with, I'll just make up my own definition. I'll just go by my own uh, standard because I don't believe the Word of God is perfect. I might believe it's true, I, may, I might believe it's right, but I don't think it has everything I need. So I'll go to the Bible for things that I think are Bible topics, but I won't go to the Bible for other things regarding my life. And the Bible says, no, it's perfect. You, you are supposed to go to the Bible for everything you need in life. It's complete. It, it's lacking nothing. So it's, it's perfect. There's no area of, of your life that's not covered by the Word of God. And that leads us right into our, our, our next point. The next one on the list is counselor. Counselor. Look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So Jesus Christ, the Word of God, capital W, He is Counselor. There's no better Counselor for the Lord. There's nothing He can't help you with. He is the Counselor. Now, look at Psalm 119 and Proverbs 19. Proverbs chapter 19 and Psalm 119. Start in Proverbs. Proverbs 19, 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. You know, the Lord's never given anyone counsel and then later have to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I know I counseled you this way, but I made a mistake, let me take that back. No, everything, every counsel he's ever given is going to stand and ha in his standing. Look at Psalm 119, look at verse number 24. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. So the Lord, Jesus Christ, he is the counselor, Isaiah 9, 6. And the word of God are our counselors, or they should be our counselors, Psalm 119, uh, verse 24. And this, this goes back to what we just talked about, the law of the Lord being perfect. You're, you are supposed to get your counsel from the word of God. You're supposed to get, you're supposed to get your counsel from the Lord, 
But how is the Lord speaking today? Not through visions, not through dreams, not through prophets, through the Word of God. So we get our counsel from the Lord. Look at, along this point, look at Isaiah chapter 30. Now, going back to the last point of perfect, why would you, why would you not go to the Lord for counsel? Well, it's usually one of two reasons. Either you know what the Lord says already and you don't want his answer, or you just don't think that you don't believe the Bible's perfect. You don't believe it has all the answers. You think it has some answers, but you don't think it has all the answers. Look at Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah 30, verse number 1. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel. Well, wouldn't you think that's a good thing? They're take, the Lord says, woe to them because they're taking counsel. That's interesting. But let's finish the verse. Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, that walk to go down into Egypt, and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh, to trust in the shadow of Egypt. The Lord is rebuking His people for seeking counsel. (laughs) Why? Because they're seeking it from someone but Him. Why are you going to Egypt? Why are you not asking of me? Egypt's a type of the world. Why, Why would you go to the world for counsel and for help when you could go to the Lord and His book? The counsel, the wisdom of God is available to you And you're going to a man, you're going to someone else, why would you do that? Now if that man, hopefully that man can can tell you what the Bible says, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the Lord's Lord's not rebuking that, Lord's rebuking going somewhere else besides the Lord and His Word. Look at chapter 31. Chapter 31, verse number 1. Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong. But they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. They're seeking help. They know they have a problem. They're looking for help. All those are great things. And the Lord says, but you're not looking in the right place. You're not looking to me. You're looking to the world for help. You're not looking to my counsel and my help. And so Jesus Christ, Isaiah 9, 6, he's the counselor. Psalm 119, verse 24, the word of God is the counselor. The Lord has all the counsel that you need for this life. It's there. It's in there. And that's why it's so important to study the word of God. Because here's here's what a lot of people do. Sadly, here's probably the, the vast majority of saved people. Here's what they do. They don't study the Bible. They don't take it seriously. They don't read it every day. They don't meditate on it. And then they have an issue, and then they have a problem. And, okay, now where is it? (laughs) Well, (laughs) it's a pretty big book if you haven't noticed. Good luck finding all the verses you need in the moment that you need it. (laughs) You're supposed to know it ahead of time. You're supposed to be in it, studying it every day. So when you do face the situation, when you do face the circumstance, you already have the counsel that you need. It's pretty tough to read Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22-21 in a day or in a week. I really have a problem. I really need help. I really need counsel. You're supposed to be reading it every day, so you have that counsel. All right. Well, actually, one more, one more on this. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse number 5. James chapter 1, verse number 5. If any of you lack wisdom, just just perchance that could be any of us here today, there could be some area in our life where we didn't have all the wisdom of God, just by some chance. (laughs) If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. I didn't say that. Let him ask of God, 
that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given, given him. Again, New Testament. You, you need counsel, you need wisdom. The Lord says, I'm right here. <laughs> I'm right here. I give to all men liberally. I abrade not. I won't rebuke you for coming to me for help. All right, next one. Next one on the list. Light. Light. Both Jesus Christ and the Word of God are said to be light. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse number 7. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. That's a capital L. That's, the, that's Jesus Christ. That all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but it was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So Jesus Christ is the light. Look at John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse number 12. Then spake Jesus again unto, the, <clears throat> unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So Jesus Christ is the light, and the Word of God is the light. Look at uh, Psalm 119. In Proverbs chapter 6, Psalm 119, in Proverbs chapter 6, Psalm 119, verse number 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light Unto my path. This world is dark. This world is very, very dark. The only way you're going to see through your uh, see clearly through this life, the only way you're going to see to be able to take the next step and the next step after that is the light of God's word. You stop reading your Bible. You've turned off the only light available to you. Proverbs chapter six, verse number twenty-three. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. Now, look at uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. So Jesus Christ is the light. The Word of God is the light. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 18. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. You know, the, the, the wicked of this world, the loss of this world, they're tripping over things and they don't even know what they're tripping over. And they're being hurt and wounded and they can't understand why. They don't get it because they've turned off the light. Now, what, what is supposed to be the path that we are supposed to take? Verse 18, the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Look, every single day you're supposed to be growing in grace and in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you read this book, the more you study this book, the better you know the Lord, the better you know this book, and you're supposed to be getting more and more and more light for your path. Now, you may have more storms, you may have more troubles, you may have more trials, but you know how to deal with them better. Every day, every day, every week, every month that goes by, you, you should be progress, progress, progressing and having more light for your path. And one day, if you're saved, that path is going to end up in the perfect day, the day of the Lord, with Jesus Christ reigning over it. There's no excuse for somebody who's saved and has the Bible to not have light for their path. Now, you may, you, the Lord usually doesn't give you too much heads up on what's coming down the road. But you ought to be able to see what your next step is, right? Every one of us has to take, take it one day at a time. Now, here's the next one. 
both the Word of God written and Jesus Christ, they both have divine and human aspects. They both have divine and human aspects. Look at John chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. John chapter 1 and 1 Timothy chapter 3. I enjoy this. I enjoy doing Bible studies like this. It's interesting to me. John chapter 1, verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word didn't stop being the Word when He, would, when he came and was made flesh. He's always been the Word. He's still the Word. The Word became flesh. So Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. Look at uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse number 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So Jesus Christ has both divine and human aspects. Now look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Verse number 20. 2 Peter 1, 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation... For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Word of God has both divine and human aspects. The Holy Ghost is the author. No, no question about it. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Lord promised to preserve His Word. But who did He use to speak it and who did He use to write it? He used men. So the written Word of God has both divine and human aspects to it. All right, the next one. Both are eternal. Both are eternal. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 9. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 9. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1:17 Now unto the king eternal immortal invisible the only wise God be honor and glory forever and ever amen So Jesus Christ is eternal uh, Look at Isaiah Isaiah chapter 9 verse number 6 We'll read this verse again For unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Everlasting Father. So, Jesus Christ is eternal. And the Word of God is eternal. Get Psalm 119 and Isaiah chapter 40. Psalm 119 and Isaiah chapter 40. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever. Look at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Praise the Lord for that. Long after you're gone, long after I'm gone, long after the scoffers of this world are gone, this Bible will still be here. It'll outlast all of them. Word of, word of God, stand forever. All right, next one. Tried. Both are tried. Look at Isaiah 28. 
Isaiah chapter 28. Look at verse number 16. Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a, for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Now, we won't turn there, but your New Testament cross-reference is 1 Peter 2, 6. But Jesus Christ, and that's, that's verified in 1 Peter 2, 6, Jesus Christ is this foundation stone. He is a tried stone. He is a precious cornerstone. So for, for, our, for our one that we're doing right now, we're doing tried. So the foundation of the church, the foundation of your life if you're saved, is not somebody that's unproven or untested. Jesus Christ is tried. He's been through the trial. He came to this world. He came to this earth. He was born sinless. And when he died, he was still sinless. He is not untested. He is not unproven. He is tried. So you don't have to wonder if your foundation is going to stand. It's already been tried. It's already been tested. Praise the Lord for that. When someone wants to uh, advertise their product, and, and, and whether it's maybe a, a, a TV ad or something, they'll, oftentimes they'll say things like, this has been tested under the most severe of, of circumstances. This has been tried. This has been put through all these tests. Jesus Christ is tried. He passed every single test in life, and he came out 100% sinless, 100% victorious. When, when the Lord tells you to build your life on the rock of Jesus Christ, he's not telling, he's not telling you to go out on a limb. He's not telling you to take a blind leap of faith. Jesus Christ is tried. He's proven. Now, look at uh, get 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel chapter 22. Second Samuel 22, verse number 31. Second Samuel 22, verse 31. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in Him. Well, praise the Lord for that. Not only is Jesus Christ tried... The word of the Lord is tried. You don't have to wonder what trusting this Bible will result in. It's been proven time and time and time again with zero failures. Nobody's ever had to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm returning this verse right here. It's defective. It doesn't work. It's been proven every time with a 100% success rate. So again, when the Lord says, I want you to trust my word, I want you to build your life on my word, he's not telling you to take a gamble. He's not telling you to take a chance. When he says, trust his word, you are trusting something that has been tried and proven. Every word of God is pure, purified seven times. When you called upon the Lord, like Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The moment you call upon the Lord, did the Lord save you? Yes, He did, just like He said He would. And you put every, you can try out every verse in this Bible, and it will come true every single time the way God said it would. Now, sometimes people get off track. They, they, they misread a verse. They misinterpret a verse. They're not reading it correctly, and so they think... God hasn't come through in some area, but a proper reading of the verse and context will show that God's word comes true every single time. It's tried, it's proven. And you can build, you, you've already trusted your eternity on it if you're saved, and so you can, you can trust your entire life on it. All right, I think we got time for one more. Next one on the list, precious. 
precious. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Both Jesus Christ and the written word are precious. Well, I said we weren't going to turn there, but we're turning there for the next one anyway. So, <laughs> First Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. That's Jesus Christ. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. So Jesus Christ is precious. Now, precious means valuable. But it's more than just valuable. It's valuable because it's rare. Now, in 1 Peter 1, in 1 Peter 1 verse number 19, the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ is precious. You know why? Because that's the only thing that can take away your sin. There's nothing else in this world that can take away your sin but the blood of Jesus Christ. So therefore, it is precious. It's not just that it takes away your sin. It's that nothing else can. And... And Jesus Christ is said to be precious. Not only can Jesus Christ save your soul, He's the only one that can. He's the only one that can do it. He's not just the Savior, He's precious. It's rare. There's no other Savior in the world that can take away your sins. He is precious. Now look at 1 Samuel 3 and Psalm 126. 1 Samuel chapter 3. And Psalm 126. First Samuel chapter 3, verse number 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli... And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. The word of the Lord was precious. Look at Psalm 126, verse number 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That seed is the seed of the Word of God. It's precious. So, what have we seen about the Word of God so far? We've seen that it's it, of both, of both, Jesus Christ and the Word of God. We've seen that it's truth. We've seen it's without error. We've seen that it's perfect, tried, among other things. But those are the ones I want to focus on right now. And the Word of God is also precious. So follow, follow the train of thought. The Word of God is, uh, I already forgot it. Number one, it's truth. It's truth. It's right in everything it says. It's without error. It has, it has no mixture of error within it. And then as we saw, it's also perfect. So not only is it right and true, it's complete. It, had, it has everything you need. And it's tried, you can count on it. And it's also precious. You know what that means? That means there's nowhere else to go in the universe to find something like that. So not only can you trust the Bible, not only is it right, not only is it true and it's tested and it's perfect, it's complete, there is no other book like it. It is precious. It is one of a kind. So... Quick review, both Jesus Christ, the Word of God, capital W, and the word of, written Word of God, they are, they are, number one, they are truth, number two, without error, number three, perfect, number four, counselor, number five, light, number six, divine and human aspects, number seven, both are eternal, number eight, tried, number nine, precious, and we have quite a few more to look at in the coming weeks. 